Uh, we're going to go now from a discussion on modernizing our national airspace system to a man involved with modernizing our space system. It's Garrett Reisman of SpaceX. But before I introduce Garrett, I want to thank all of you for being here this week. In addition to our pilots, I want to thank our guests from industry and from government. We can't affect change alone. We need to have continuing positive relationships to make sure that the necessary safety, security, and pilot assistance advances are put into place. So I thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts during this forum. I talked repeatedly this week about the influence of just one, that just one person can have. How many of our safety and security advances started with just one person having an idea or a problem or a fix. We all work together to achieve great results, but we need that one to start. SpaceX was started by one man, Elon Musk, who had a goal to grow a garden on Mars. Now today that goal has evolved and grown into one of the preeminent private space transport service companies in the world. Our closing speaker today, Garrett Reisman, is an important part of SpaceX, focused on astronaut safety and on, and on mission assurance. What each of you are doing for flight oper operations and airplanes, then Garrett is doing for flight operations in Sp SpaceX now. He's at the forefront of making sure commercial missions go off without a hitch, coordinating with both the FAA and Na NASA. When SpaceX finally puts that garden on Mars, Garrett will be directly involved. I'm sure, I'm confident of it. He's a former astronaut as well as an aquanaut, having spent time both on the International Space Station and in the Aquarius Underwater Laboratory. So he's been everywhere on, under, and over the Earth, you could say. And now he's here, so please join me in welcoming Garrett Reisman to the stage. Thanks. It's really, uh, really an honor to be here, and uh, thanks, Captain Moak, for that great intro, and also thanks to Lori Garver uh, for uh, inviting me uh, and, and uh, to come here initially. And uh, it's great to be back amongst friends. And, and Lori and I go back to our our days at NASA, and uh, I know she's doing great work for you. And and we but we miss her at NASA because she was a a great champion for a lot of the work that we're doing and the path that I'm about to talk to you about about commercial space. Uh, really, uh, it, was, it was her efforts that led us to where we are today, and, um, and hopefully we have a really bright future, which I'm about to tell you about. So uh, it's great to be here. It's also great to be back amongst uh, pilots. Um, uh, in addition to uh, the other things I've done, I own a Grumman Tiger <laughs> that I keep. All right. You got one too? No. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great airplane. I keep it at Hawthorne Airport, so the next time you're into final approach into LAX and you see a tiger struggling to maintain glide slope off to your left, that might be me. Um, so uh, it's, it's really fantastic to, uh, to be here. So if I can go to the slides, let's see if we can... Here we go. Okay, so I started out uh, at NASA as an astronaut, and I flew a couple missions. The first one was uh, STS... 123, it was on Endeavour, and I went up to the space station. I stayed there for 95 days on the space station. And I got to tell you that um, it was kind of a bummer because if you stay for 100 days, you get a patch. <laughs> it's true. I'm not making this up. You get a patch. And uh, so in 95 days, the space shuttle Discovery came up and said, hey, Garrett, it's time to go home. How about you uh, hop on board and, uh, and we're, we'll head home? And I said, hey, guys, you know, just five more days. Can we just go around a few more times? You know, nobody will notice. And I said, no, Mission Control says we have to come home. I said, okay. So I got home, and I, I didn't get my patch. 
And then NASA said, hey, Garrett, we got another mission for you, STS-132 on Atlantis, 14 days. And I said, aha, 95, 14, I can get my patch. I said, sign me up, I'll go. So I got on Atlantis, we went back up into space, and I went back to the International Space Station, and I came home, and I'm all excited and ready to get my patch, and I said, uh-uh, it's got to be in a row. <laughs> so I still don't have my patch. It's not like I'm bitter about it or anything, now, you know? <laughs> I'll get over it someday. It would, it would go on my, on my uh, flight jacket, it would go right here, kind of right above my heart, and I have a big empty spot above my heart, but it's okay. <laughs> But that was, I had a great career at NASA. I got to do a bunch of spacewalks. I got to do a bunch of really awesome things. And, and most importantly, I flew with some really great crews. And I was really very privileged and lucky to be, to be part of that. Uh, but near, near the end of my, right after that second mission, I came back and I was flying in a T-38 to go to Edwards Air Force Base to train uh, for shuttle landing uh, simulations that we're doing out there. And we landed that day. And there's a day that this happened. This, this is... Back in uh, 2010, uh, SpaceX launched this rocket, the Falcon 9, and at the top you see the Dragon spacecraft. And Dragon went up into space, and like the, the map at the top indicates, went around the Earth two times, came back, landed in the Pacific Ocean, and SpaceX became the first private company to send something to space and bring it back. And at that time, that was something that only about six or seven nations had accomplished. So that was a really big deal. And I, we landed, and the Air Force lineman came up to service the jet, and he looked up, and he saw the big NASA logo on the tail. And he said, hey, congratulations on that awesome flight of the Dragon. That was so cool. And he was so excited. Uh, and, but my first reaction was, well, that was really SpaceX I mean, that did that, not NASA. Um, but then I thought, oh, wait a minute. It's a public-private partnership. NASA was very much involved and, and, and never would have happened without NASA. And at that, once I made that realization, I promptly took all the credit. I said, oh, thank you very much. Glad you liked that dragon. I designed it myself, you know. Uh, so, but I saw something there. I saw some excitement uh, that I hadn't seen in a while. And that was really interesting. And so I started looking around at what was happening and what this new initiative that NASA was taking to, to involve the private sector more and give more freedom to the private sector to innovate. And I saw all this innovation happening. I saw uh, companies doing really great work. And, and I knew that this was a, a promise for a really bright future in space. This is where progress was going to happen. And I wanted to be a part of it. So I did something that was very difficult, which is I voluntarily stopped being an astronaut. Because I tell you, that was a really great gig. Uh, but I, I voluntarily stepped away from that and said, I want to sign up with SpaceX. And I've been there now for three and a half years working on uh, turning this spacecraft uh, that we use to take cargo up to the space station into a, a human carrying vehicle. This is what it looks like. If you compare that to the previous slide, you see there are some significant differences in the, in the, in the uh, spacecraft. Um, this is the one that will take people. And we've had now four times successfully brought cargo up to the space station and brought cargo home. Uh, with the previous version, but this guy uh, has a bunch of advancements that make it suitable for carrying people. First of all, it'll carry up to seven people. You see a shot there of the, there'll be, the, the interior looks awesome in that, in that picture. We're going to put some, a lot of cargo and stuff in there. It's not going to look quite that spacious, but we are capable of carrying up to seven people. We have an ECLA system, the life support system that you need, uh, that cargo doesn't need. And we have a launch escape system. And that's the key thing that we're doing to improve safety, which is having the ability, which we did not have on shuttle, by the way. If you're having a bad day uh, on, the, on the Falcon 9, if the Falcon 9 launch vehicle is having a bad day, you can light up those Super Draco engines and have a launch abort system, like an ejection seat that will take the capsule uh, to safety, just like we had previously in uh, Apollo and Gemini and, and Mercury. Uh, so we're working on that. We have eight of those engines. You see in the second picture down there, there's one of those Super Draco engines. And it'll be quite a ride. If, um, if this happens on the pad, you'll, you'll have about five to six Gs of initial acceleration. And that'll last about five seconds. Uh, and then there'll be a nice little coast phase. That's what those fins are for that you saw in the, in the other picture. Um, 
We have the capability to use those engines also because we don't throw them away, we hold on to them, and we can use them for propulsive landing. We always will have pa uh, parachutes for, for, at least for backup, but we want to eventually land this thing fully propulsively so that you can just fill it up with gas and fly it again. One thing about, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but we are trying at SpaceX to get more and more like you guys. We're trying to bring space more and more into commercial aviation. And w one of the examples of that is, Elon will say this a lot, he says, well, you know, you never see a 737 land with parachutes, right? And they have to pack them or get new ones for the next flight. He wants to be reusable. He wants, he wants to the point where the, as much of the, as, of the rocket and the spacecraft comes back, you, you taxi to the gate, you fill it up with gas, and you go again, right? That's what the, the model we're trying to attain is what you do every day. And so that's one example of that. We also have landing legs that will help us land on harder surfaces and, uh, and on land, obviously, instead of right now our cargo ship comes back in the ocean. But that's not a good way to bring people back. And then uh, what we're trying to do is take NASA astronauts to and from the International Space Station. But by the way, we have a heat shield uh, there that is capable of, of three times the heat flux of a nominal entry from low Earth orbit. So what that means is, at least from a, a thermal protection standpoint, we can do missions to the, to the moon. So we're looking beyond. So like I said, we, we want to be more like you guys. We're trying very, very hard to be as good as you. And one of the stark ways that I could describe how far we have to go is on this chart. Now, first thing I want to point out is that this is not to, to scale in the sense that it's a, well, it is a scale. It's a logarithmic scale. Because what, what I did was I, I went and got all these statistics on how risky are different uh, endeavors, different events. And you see the one out there in the far left that has got the lowest chance of fatality. It's actually one in five, over five and a half million. So better than one in five and a half million. That's, that's, that's you guys. That's commercial air flight domestically in the US. And by the way, all these numbers are dead on balls accurate because I got them all from Wikipedia. <laughs> so, so if you have any questions about where I got these numbers from, it's a simple answer. Um, but anyway, but that, you, know, you guys know that. You know you're in the one in a million plus uh, level of uh, you know, chance of a, a fatality on a domestic flight. Now, if you go down from there, the next one you see is driving from L.A. to San Francisco. That's a one in 174,000. Flying on a military aircraft, well, that's one in about 100,000. It goes down. Flying general aviation one in 27,000. We're getting worse and worse and worse. And I'll, maybe next year I could come back and talk to you guys about why general aviation is nowhere near as good as, as you guys. Um, but then anyway, in combat, military aircraft in combat, one in 7,500. Now, you still, I'm still talking all aviation. Uh, and I haven't gotten to anything in space yet, right? Now, the next thing is the requirement of where NASA wants us to be. This is what they... Uh, want us to attain with the next generation of spacecraft, and that's one in 270. That's our aspirational goal, one in 270. You guys are at one in five and a half million. Uh, where have we been up till now, space shuttle? One in 68. We flew 135 space shuttle missions. We lost two of them. So one in 68. Uh, if you climb Mount Everest, that's even slightly riskier. That's one in 67. <laughs> but about the same dangers as uh, flying in a space shuttle. Soyuz is even worse, one in 58. And finally, way down there for comparison's sake, it, uh, modern ejection seat. Um, that's, the, the number there is, is, is misleading because that's when the guys pulled the handle. Um, that's their success rate after they pulled it. Many of them, you know, they pulled it way too late. So... Um, so, you know, if you were straight and level inside the heart of the envelope, that number would be a lot better. But look how bad we are in space. One in 68, you know. We've got a long, long, long way to go. Well, why, why is that? Why, why, is, why are we so much worse than you guys? Well, some of it is, is basic physics. Uh, the kinetic energy of our dragon is roughly uh, 100 times, so two orders of magnitude, uh, 
what, what it would be of a Boeing 757. So this was kind of funny. I was actually flying over here, and, and not that I procrastinate or anything, but I, I was putting my presentation together on the, on the plane ride here yesterday, and <laughs> I was sitting in the back of a United uh, 757 from LAX to, to Dulles, and I asked the uh, flight attendant, I said, hey, can you do me a favor? I'm trying to put this uh, presentation together for uh, uh, airline, you know, uh, for this, this keynote address I'm giving, and, and, and uh, can you ask the captain, uh, what's our gross takeoff weight and what's our cruise speed in knots? And she, she looked at me like, what? <laughs> what kind of request? Did, all, I, all I wanted to ask was, do you want, you know, something to drink? <laughs> but she actually did. And I got these numbers from the captain. So a mass of 242,000 pounds compared to our vehicle, Crew Dragon, is 10 times less than that at 20, just over 20,000 pounds. But the speed, look at the speed. Um, when I converted 480 knots to miles per hour, I got 552. Orbital velocity in low Earth orbit is 17,500 miles an hour. And since energy goes as the square root of velocity, there's a huge difference in the energy. So we go 30 times as fast as that 757, and we go, but we have 100 times the energy. So I guess if you got hit, if you got run over by a dragon, <laughs> it would feel like you just got run over by 100 757s. <laughs> Which actually, the, the end result's going to be the same. But uh, <laughs> anyway, there's a lot more energy involved. OK, that's, and then as far as loads, uh, I, the, the, uh, we have to design our vehicle to survive up to 30 Gs, a peak G of up to 30. And that's only hap that only happens during emergency cases, but that's what we design for. Uh, we have a thermal environment that's very unforgiving, plus or minus hundreds of degrees, depending on if you're in the sun or if you're in the shade up in space. We have vibration and acoustics. Our engines make, shake a lot more, make a lot more noise than, than airline engines do. And, and we have a much uh, more difficult radiation environment to deal with. So our avionics have to struggle with that. So there's some things that are just the laws of physics. But there are other things that don't have to do with the laws of physics that also explain why we haven't closed this gap faster. If you think about it, um, we've been flying in space now with humans for over 50 years. It's about the same time that we've been flying jet passenger planes, right? So in that same period of time, look at the improvements you guys have made in safety from o over the same time. It's not, you don't get the, you don't, we can't say that, oh, well, airplanes are, are safer because we've been doing them a lot longer. Well, yeah, you've been doing them twice as long if you count the right flyer, right? But if you look at jet, av jet aviation, where it was, in, uh, at the same time that, we flew, that Yuri Gagarin flew and became the first person in space, look at the leaps and strides that you have made, and we, we've got to one in 68. So, but the flight rate has been a lot less. So we flew during the shuttle years an average of four and a, four and a half sorties per year. I mean, that's probably how many takeoffs occur from Dulles in, what, about 10 minutes or so, right? <laughs> So, so obviously the flight rate is vastly different. The rate of new vehicle development is, is vastly different. We're about to do our first test flights uh, in Dragon. We're only a couple years away from that. And when we do that, that will be the first human test flights of any space vehicle in the United States for over 30 years. The last time we did test flights with humans on board was STS-1, this very first space shuttle flight, and that was in 1981. So we have not been it takes us 30 years to, to get to the next generation of vehicle, where I, I don't know how many Boeing and Airbus and uh, McDonnell Douglas airplanes came and went in that same 30-year period. But the other thing that, th those two things are difficult to do something about because the demand and, and the economics are such, but one of the things that we can do something about is it's, we find it is very difficult to incorporate new technologies, which sounds weird. Because you think about space and NASA is really being on the, on the cutting edge, all about the latest and greatest in technology. But in reality, um, there, there's, there, and, and, and NASA cares a lot about safety. All of us that work in this business care a lot about safety. But in a weird way, our, we care too much. That's, a, I guess, a weird thing to say. But we have, our risk aversion has, has led to are, are, is led to kind of a situation where it's hard to innovate. It's hard to incorporate new technologies. So if, as a contractor building a new vehicle, the path of least resistance 
is to do the same thing and use the same technologies, the same processes that we have always used. Because if I do that, I will sail through certification. There'll be no questions asked. We won't have to have a lot of meetings. I won't have to come up come reams and reams of data. But if I try something new, if I try additive manufacturing, you know, 3D printing, which we're using to build our rocket engines, if I want to uh, use modern electronics instead of space qualified class S, class B parts the way they've always been done, uh, if I want to do software engineering in an agile way instead of using software standards that were written for mainframe computing, I have a mountain to climb. I have a really tough uphill battle to try to get certified because this, this, there's, there's a tremendous burden that's placed on and, and doing things any, any different way. Now, the thing about that is the, the, the fear, of course, is, is that, well, if you, if you don't really closely examine these new technologies, you can get burned and something unexpected could happen. But the perverse effect is that by being so concerned about doing something new because you're going to do something risky, you lock in safety at 1 in 68. You'll never get better if you don't do something new. So we have this risk aversion that's leading us to some extent to paralysis. The other thing is once you build the thing, it's hard to improve it. It's hard to, one thing that uh, is really important, as you guys know, is continuous improvement. You need to listen to the vehicle. You got to look carefully at what it's saying. You guys look really carefully at your vehicles, right? Every time you're flying around, you're sending reams of data down to central, central locations where you go through and, and analyze all that data, how, your engines, your performance, your, uh, your environments, all that stuff. We, we collect a lot of data too, uh, but it's really important that when you, when you see a problem in that data that you are able to fix it. The problem we have is that we, we have this high cost structure in the industry, and, and that makes it very expensive to change things. We've solved that problem at SpaceX to a large degree because we're vertically integrated. We make about 80% of that Dragon and the Falcon 9 in our own facility. So if we want to change something, we don't have to go to our subcontractor's vendor, you know, many tiers down, and rewrite, get the lawyers involved, and rewrite the contract, rewrite the subsystem specs. We do it all, so we just say, you know what? Let's fix that. So we don't have all the, all the uh, barriers, the cost barriers, to making that change. But we do have a certification barrier. So the way we do certification uh, right now in space, it really discourages any change to the baseline configuration. Once you've got the, the design baseline, if you, if you change anything, it's really, really expensive because of the paperwork burden involved with any changes. I'll give you, I'll give you uh, my favorite example on this which is after we flew in Atlantis in, in STS-132, we thought at the time it, it might be the last flight of Atlantis. It turned out, thanks actually a lot to Lori's efforts, that we ended up flying Atlantis one more time, which was a great thing for the space station program, a great thing for the shuttle program. But we, we thought we might be the last. So we, we, we called ourselves the, the first final flight of Atlantis. <laughs> and so while we're up on space, the day before we did the deorbit burn and came, and, and to come home, we went up to the flight deck, and we took one of our mission patches as a sticker, and we took that sticker and we put it on the flight deck in a, in a region that was pretty easy to, to access in, in, um, in zero G, but difficult to get to in, in one G. So we thought maybe nobody would find this thing, right? So we put it up there, and we, we all signed it. We signed our names next to our patch, and then we put uh, some words at the top. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but basically said the first, uh, the first final flight of Atlantis uh, she was a great ship, and you know, blah, blah. And we put that up there. Well, guess what? While they were doing the maintenance to turn around to fly one more time, somebody found it. <laughs> and they said, you know what, um, guys, we're going to have to scrape it off. I said, why? They said, well, if we let it stay there, we have to do all this paperwork. We have to prove that we don't have to reopen any certification, that there's no issues. We have to uh, redo the drawing. The engineering drawing for that panel has to be redone with the sticker on there. And, and we estimate it's going to cost a couple million dollars. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> this really happened, right? And we're like, wow, that is so pathetic. But, um, but we're like, OK, you know, scrape it off. But that's how hard it is to change anything, even something as simple as sticking a, uh, putting a sticker on something. So more, by the way, the upshot of that whole thing was that uh, when they rolled Atlantis into the visitor center, at the Kennedy Space Center, 
somebody looked who knew the story, and it was still there. So the technician that was charged with scraping it off just didn't do it. <laughs> and you know what? Atlantis flew one more mission, and she didn't fall out of the sky. <laughs> So anyway, that's how hard it is to, to change something. And, and this is really bad. This is really, really bad. Because if you look at the two catastrophes we had in the shuttle program, if you look at Challenger and you look at Columbia, what happened there was not that we killed people because we were changing things willy-nilly and not being careful. What happened was we killed people because there was a problem that we knew about that we didn't fix in both cases. If we were continuously improving, uh, we would have potentially solved those problems and, and saved those lives. I, I assert that the problem we have is not uh, that we change too many things, it's that we're not changing enough things. And you know, there are other things that, uh, that they, we did move heaven and earth to fix. We had other problems like cracks in the feed lines in the space shuttle engines and things where we stood down the fleet and spent a lot of money and bit the bullet. and and and, uh, and fix them. And that was probably the right thing to do. But the problem is with a vehicle that is comp as complicated as a spacecraft, you can't really know what's going to kill you next. It's really very, very difficult. We did all that. We fixed the feed, line, feed liner cracks, but we never fixed the foam coming off the tank. We never fixed the hot gases getting past those O-rings. And we killed two crews. Well, I think uh, I'm doing pretty well on time. I think what I'd like to do is I, I might need a little help with this one to start this movie. But I'd like to show you uh, a little bit of the, of the um, that was kind of, I don't want to end on that note. That was a very negative note to end on. <laughs> so I got a really cool movie <laughs> that shows you some of the uh, really cool stuff that we're doing at uh, SpaceX today. And at SpaceX, we're, we're all about that continual improvement, constantly searching for ways we can make our, our product and our processes better. And, uh, and, and we're going to, we're not going to take the path of least resistance. We're not going to just do things the way they've always been done. Even if it's a big fight, and even if it's going to take a lot of extra effort, we're going to make this better. And that's the only way that we're going to get to a place where we're really doing amazing things in space. But here's a preview of what's to come. Three, two, one, and lift off. Dragon is in orbit. Flying up in a, a human rated dragon is uh, not going to be an issue. So I, can, <laughs> so I can tell you, look, we're, we're in a, I know you had a speaker the other day talk to you uh, and was kind of a little bit uh, negative about where we are right now in, in terms of space. But I can tell you, there, this is a painful period. For about three years now, since Atlantis really did fly her last flight, the United States of America no longer has the capability to send men and women into space. And we have to rely on our good friends, the Russians, to take our, our astronauts up and down to the to space station. Now, this is not a good place for this country to be. Uh, we led the way in space for so long. Uh, it's not um, what any of us that are working in, in the space industry are comfortable with. But what we're doing is we are retooling, right? And what I tell people all the time is that it's never sexy when you retool the factory. 
You never bring tours in of people and take the trams by to watch a factory being retooled. It's when the bright, shiny toys roll out of the factory and start flying around that people are going to get excited. NASA has not stepped down one bit from committing to human spaceflight and committing to leadership of human spaceflight. In fact, you know, popular, contrary to popular uh, myth, the, the budgets at NASA have stayed flat or even gone up over the past six years. We're not backing down. We're simply, we had to stop flying the shuttle because the shuttle was costing us three-ish billion dollars a year, and there's no way Congress was going to give us another three billion dollars a year to, to do something new. But as I think I made very clear, it's really important that we do something new, that we do better. We have to do better than one in 68. And we have to have a program that's sustainable as well as we make it better than one in 68. And that's exactly what we're doing. And that's what NASA has been focused on. Uh, and, and soon the whole world will see that, OK? So yeah, right now we're in this painful period where we don't have the capability to send humans into space. But stick with us because in just a couple more years, we're going to be sending humans into space again. Uh, we're going to be doing human test flights in just a couple years. So we'll be launching Americans on American rockets, launching from American soil. We're going to come roaring back, and it's going to be awesome. So stay tuned. Thanks. Question, Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Be happy to. Thank you, Dr. Fleischman. That was very interesting. A lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. Uh, we can really uh, uh, identify with a, a lot of what you just said. Dr. Reisman has agreed to take one or two questions, if we have, uh, if we have any out there. <laughs> I have one. Hey, that was a great presentation. Loved it. Super. Oh, thanks. Are there any technological advances in the work that you guys have done that we can use? and this vice versa, what, can, what have we done that you found would be useful for what you do? Yeah, so, so absolutely. Um, there's a, there's a, there's some, some of the things I think that, that might be of, of most benefit to, that we're doing uh, is, is probably additive manufacturing. You know, we're, we're finding that uh, the, the freedom you have as a designer to, to, to do things that you never could do before because you were constrained by the, the machining process all that gets lifted when you can print your, your parts. So I think that uh, we'll, we'll, we're making rocket engines out of these things. And, and, and once we all get comfortable with their performance and the strength of materials issues, I think that holds great promise for, for aircraft as well. Um, but in addition, uh, there's a lot, a lot that we can learn from, from, from you. And in fact, that's where we started. When we started looking at, well, how can we make our, now that we're flying people, how can we make our avionics uh, better? We actually looked at, hey, what, what's the, what are the avionics, what's the flight computer, how many flight computers are in a, seven, triple, a 777? Uh, and we started looking at those architectures to learn how you guys do dissimilar redundancy. What kind of backup modes do you have for manual piloting uh, in the event of a, of a failure of those automated systems? So we're learning already a lot from you. I know there's a lot more we can learn. Hi, Brian Smith, NASA Ames. Hi. I'm a, <laughs> a NASA guy and a pilot. Can you speak a little bit to the human factors uh, of the Dragon flight deck to give us pilots a little bit of insight as to what it might look like and feel like? Sure. Uh, the, the, the Dragon uh, has seven people, but the flight crew really is, is just two, a, a, a commander and a pilot. We've always called in space you know, a commander and a pilot because um, you know, it's really pilot and co-pilot, but we, our, our guys have so many thousands of hours of, and these big test pilots and stuff, so they they didn't want to be called a co-pilot, so it had to be a pilot and a commander, even though the pilot doesn't fly, the commander flies, so it's all kind of weird. But, but anyway... It's a good CRM anyway. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's also, yeah. We call it SFRM, Space Flight uh, uh, Resource Management, but whatever. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, so so uh, in Dragon, we're going to have a commander and a pilot, and there's going to be a, a, a display panel, and, and basic, the, the basic mode, and this is another thing, that actually, I could talk to you guys about all day, which is, where do you draw the line between automation and, and, and human in the loop, right? And that's a, that's, a, that's a debate that's been going on in both of our areas of expertise uh, for a long time. And it's a, it's a debate that's alive and well. And where we're at right now with Dragon is, is its primary mode of operation is going to be automatic. And it has to be because we're going to use exactly the same vehicle to take cargo up with nobody sitting inside. So it has to work 
with nobody at the controls uh, and maybe just a little bit of help from the ground. Uh, so, so that's going to be the primary mode. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to we're gonna put in manual backup mode. So you'll be, there will be a stick and you'll be able to manually fly, uh, fly this thing in the event that the automated system uh, fails you. You'll be able to do a manual docking, manual uh, attitude adjustment, and probably even manual deorbit burn. Great. Thanks. Sure. We've got time for one more question. Sir. Thanks. Wonderful presentation. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Um, I work in our flight operational quality assurance side of ALPA. We look at flights and kind of analyze how they did, how the crew did. If there, we have some questions, we'll, we'll call them and ask them. Right. Sort of a preemptive way of looking at safety. Do you have a similar program for, for your company? Um, well, we certainly, we certainly do look at, at the data. So every, every test we do on the ground and every flight we have of our rocket, uh, we look at that data. And by the way, one thing I mentioned about one of the things that hampers us is our low flight rate. But one of the things that helps us at, at, at SpaceX, those rockets you see launching, are when we launch a satellite like we did just a couple days ago, we use exactly the same rocket that's going to be carrying people. So our flight rate actually is going to be, instead of four and a half a year, it's going to be one a month is where we're at right now. And we're going to get to about uh, three times that, that, that rate soon. So, um, so, so, so that's one way we'll build flight heritage without, without having to fly people every single time. But we do look at the data, and I think that's one of the most important things we do from a mission assurance standpoint. Uh, and, and, then, and, then we, and then we try to fix it. And, and when we put humans in a loop, we're certainly going to look at that data as well. We always did at NASA and had very extensive debriefs. After each of my shuttle flights, we spent, the first thing you do is come home. Well, first thing they do is they have a little ceremony. But after that, um, uh, then you, you go home and spend about two weeks doing nothing but debriefing every day on every single uh, system and every single group that was involved with the flight. So we'll, we'll do the same. Thanks for coming. Sure. That's great. Let's give uh, Dr. Reisman another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.